The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him so that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Well, then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided to, to, uh, to what I to do so that when I'm dismissed as a manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? And he answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. And then he asked another, How much, more, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager for the, for, because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, you, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Because whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with a dishonest wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? Because no slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When Karen... Morse was about to graduate from high school in 1984, she revealed to everyone the fact that she could not read or write even at the most basic level. Now, Karen was a member of the National Honor Society. She was in Who's Who in America's uh, high schools. She had been the class president, and she was the student council president. She was a superb orator, a model student, but yet Karen was a severe dyslexic who had developed elaborate ruses throughout her 12 years of school to cover the fact that she couldn't even read street signs. For her whole life, Karen lived in fear that people would unmask her inadequacy. All of her energy went in concealing the truth, and she became a slave to protecting that false image. You know, a lot of people play that game in their relationship with God, in their heart of hearts, they know the hidden sins that prevent them, them from developing a full relationship with their Lord. And deep down, they know that their spiritual activities are really just a facade. They know that things are not all what they pretend to be. But it has become far more important for them to maintain that image than to possess their reality. But as is clear in our second reading this morning from Timothy, God wants us to drop our self-imposed masks and become truly authentic in our faith, faith and, and in our living. And there are a few ways, really, that we can do that. For example, one way, or one, one is we need to grow in our faith. We need to grow, always, ever-growing. And you know, it's kind of sad when somebody feels they no longer need to grow. Kind of like the story of the wealthy gold miner who had a son destined to take over the family business. And the father sent the son back east to study at the finest of the engineering schools and to learn all he could about managing of the mines. 
And the young man studied hard, and he proudly received his degree. And upon graduation, he said to his father, he said, Dad, I'm ready to go to work. Give me your best mind, and I'll show you how it's done. Well, the father replied, no, son, wait, wait. First of all, put on some work clothes and go down into the mine. And get, get some experience. You just start at breakfast, you just start at the body, at bottom and then work your way up. Uh, but the son insisted, he said, no, Dad, I've been to school, I've got my diploma, and with all due respect, I know more about mining than you do. So give me your best mine and I'll prove it to you. Well, the father, against his better judgment, gave his son his most productive mine. And for a while it went well. And then one day the father received a letter. And the letter said, Dad, you know that mine I'm working at is backed up to a lake. And water's starting to seep in. We shored it up, but the shoring doesn't seem to hold. What do you think we ought to do? And the father didn't answer. Well, a few more weeks later, the son wrote again. He said, look, Dad, this is serious. We're not able to stop the water. What do you think we should do? And still no answer from the father. Frantically, the son then wired the father. And he said, if you don't give me an answer soon, we're going to lose the entire mine. What should I do? Finally, the father wired back. He said, son, take your diploma and shove it into the leak. Yeah, it's kind of sad when people think they've already arrived. That's probably one of the reasons Jesus told us that we should become like a little child. Because for the most part, a child is teachable. And remember, they did call Jesus rabbi and teacher. And so he is. We learn from him. We study his words. We marvel at his example. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will walk in his presence. We learn from him in a way that we can learn from no other. Okay? Now, another thing we have to realize is we have to realize we never can and we never will be able to go it alone. That Jesus Christ is our one and our only advocate. Some of you may have heard the story of Peter Zinger in 1735. It's a fairly famous story. Zinger was a German immigrant and a local printer who dared to take a stand against a very corrupt governor named William S. Cosby. It's a different Bill Cosby, but it's still the same name. Now, Governor Cosby's acts became more and more outrageous, and Zinger's newspaper spoke more and more harshly about those acts. And Cosby had Zinger jailed. Cosby's justices then had lawyers, his lawyers disbarred when they tried to step forward and defend him. Although no charges were placed against Zenger, his bail was set at an enormous 800 pounds. In today's money, I did a Google search. That's the equivalent of $202,800 in today's money. For two months, Zenger still sat in jail although the jury, grand jury refused to indict him for anything. After nine months, Zinger went to trial for publishing, quote, false, scandalous, malicious, and seditious libel. Now remember, his original attorneys had been disbarred. His current lawyer had been, uh, uh, had been appointed by a Cosby man, and the jury had been instructed to rule only on whether Zinger did or did not publish the newspaper. His guilt as to the libel in the paper had already been, had been decided. Zenger didn't have any chance of an acquittal. But then something happened. In the back, from the back of the courtroom, a dignified, well-dressed gentleman arose, and he walked forward to the front. He announced that he would represent Zinger pro bono. Well, this man was immediately recognized as Andrew Hamilton, a respected member of the Pennsylvania Council and the Philadelphia Assembly, and a very, very uh, celebrated lawyer. Hamilton admitted that Zinger was the publisher, 
but pled for the right of men everywhere to be able to publish the truth. And Zinger was acquitted before Jesus Christ. Everyone throughout time stood on trial for their sins. And their outcome of that, their case was always certain. The outcome was always a sentence of death. But this time, a certain man stepped forward for our, on our behalf. Didn't plead for our innocence, for we had no innocence. No, he pled for the right to take our guilty place and then for us to become pardoned. He pled for the right to be sacrificed in our place. Oh, what a beautiful portrait of love, the love of God when we all hear, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, Christ died for us. Did you know that there was such an influx of synthetic emeralds that flooded the market, and they didn't know which one were synthetic and which one were the real ones? So perfect were those synthetics. No one could tell one from the other. But they found out if you wanted to know which of the two emeralds is synthetic and which one is genuine, what you did was you heated both stones to a prescribed temperature, and then you give them both a tap with a small hammer. The one that breaks, that's the real one. My family in the faith, we know that God's love is real. We know God's love is real because we can see his heart break from the, on that hill in Calvary. Well, finally, let us remember that no matter what, Jesus Christ is truly and always the one who is in charge. Always he is in charge. Always he is the one who is our master. There's a little story about how Abraham Lincoln went down to a slave block to buy back a slave girl. Now the slave girl looked at this tall, rather homely-looking white man bidding on her, and she was sure that he was just another white man who was going to buy her and then abuse her. Well, Lincoln won the bid, and as he was walking away with his property, he said, young lady, you are free. And she said, well, what does that mean? He said, it means you're free. Does that mean I can say whatever I want to say? And Lincoln said, yes, my dear, you can say whatever you want to say. And she said, does that mean I can be whatever I want to be? And Lincoln said, yes, you can be whatever you want to be. And she said, does that mean I can go wherever I want to go? And Lincoln said, yes, you can go wherever you want to go. And that girl with tears streaming down her face, said, well then, I will go with you. And that is our response. After we have experienced, we have truly experienced Christ as an integral part of our lives. When we realize that Jesus Christ has truly set us free. No more facade, no more pretense, free to be all that God has created us to be. And that is why our hope, that is why our only hope is in Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, who is our Lord, and who is truly our truest friend. Amen.